Fenomena To the living God No one can deny That Jesus Christ So, so we've been in this sermon series on, on, on dealing with fear. And as we've been studying in this series, God began to show me this conversation that I had with my cousin. Now, many of you guys know that my cousin Eric uh, was killed about a month ago. We left for a few days to, to go down and be with our family. And as I've been kind of studying through this, this sermon series, God has been constantly pulling back a conversation. Actually, it was the last conversation that I had with my cousin before he died. And in that conversation, this 28-year-old, probably 27 years old at the time, uh, was, was young man was telling me at my grandmother's funeral that he felt like God was beginning to pull him toward ministry. And what he was saying to me was, he was saying, I feel like God is, is preparing me to do some kind of ministry. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but I, I know that I'm not supposed to be out here in the streets. I know I'm not supposed to be doing some of the things that I'm doing. I'm in the process of changing what I do and, and, and who I hang out with and, and, and the way that I do things. I'm in the process of changing, and I feel like God is literally pulling me toward ministry. He said to me, he said, I, I, I don't believe that I'm going to be a pastor like you. I don't, I don't know if that's my calling. He says, but I hear God calling me. He said, I, I'm not sure if I'm going to be in a church somewhere or whether I'm going to be out here on the streets that I'm in now helping to change lives because I understand, I hear the call of God. I understand what's right. But at the same time, he was saying, I, I'm still out there a little bit. He, he says, I'm working on it. He asked me to pray for him, and I said, I'll pray for you. He asked me to pray for him because he says, although I hear this call from God, and he said, it's so clear to me. I hear God calling me. I know God wants to use me. I know what God wants to do through me. I know what God wants me to do. He says, sometimes I still struggle with doing the things that God is asking me to do. He says, sometimes I fall short of what I believe a minister is supposed to be or what I believe a ministry should look like. He said, but I'm taking my time because I don't want to get out there and then mess up. And, and I got to thinking about that, and I've been thinking about that as we've been going through this series because I believe that this is one of our number one fears. Listen, this fear of self-control, this fear of self-discipline, this fear that, that we're going to go out and mess up, this fear that we know ourselves better than everybody else know us, and if folk knew the things that went through our minds, if folk knew what I was thinking about, even while I was talking to them, even while I'm in church sometimes, if folk knew the way I get aggravated at folks, even at church sometimes, if folk knew the, the, the type of language that I use when I'm outside of church, if, if folk knew the stuff that I watch on the internet, if folk knew the stuff that I watch on TV, if folk knew the people I hang out with, if folk knew the places I go, the places I've been, then, then, then I wouldn't be worthy of no call and I wouldn't be able to do anything in, in ministry. And, and what I want to talk with you about today, because, because as I began to think about what that young man was telling me, I began to see that that is me also. Amen. But that, that was me before I accepted my call, and that was me after I accepted my call. That was me on the way to in here today. And if you want to take some time and really, really, really be honest with yourself. I think we all struggle with this. We all struggle with, with the flesh, this, this thing inside of us, although we want to do the right thing, that it begins to pull us to, to, to the wrong thing. I think we all struggle with, 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 with some, some issues with our loose tongue. There's some things that we want to say and we know we we have even practiced them when I get that when I get home tonight I'm gonna to walk in. I'm gonna say this beautiful thing to my wife I'm gonna say you look beautiful today. I hope you had a great day or what have you and, and then you come in and, and the house is a mess the kids have messed up You got all these things. the wife didn't cook so dinner's not on the table and all of a sudden instead of you saying that nice thing that you plan on saying you end up saying some mean stuff to the kids, to the wife, to everybody that's get on the phone and, and tell the best friend about it. And all of a sudden, this mouth 
which was supposed to be blessing somebody, ends up cursing somebody. I, I think we all struggle in areas sometimes with self-discipline in our finances. We, we get these things in our life where we say, hey, I've got to have these things, and these things may be different for somebody and different for another person. For somebody, it might be a purse. For somebody, it might be a car. But when we get to this place where we become these impulse buyers, we've got we've to buy it. We've got to have it right now. We, we don't care about the bills. We don't care about what impact it's going to have on our ability to be generous to others or, or, or to be safe or feel secure. And we allow for all these fears around our finances to come in because we what? We don't have self-discipline in our finances. For, for, for some folks, you're struggling with lust. I mean, you don't feel like you are capable. And part of the reason why you don't feel like you're capable, if we're honest with each other, is because you come from a generation of uncles who didn't do it right. That's what God said to me prophetically. He said, you need to speak to him. You come from a generation of people who you saw model stuff the wrong way. And so you just assume that you're going to end up doing the exact same thing you saw your uncles do and your aunties do. The exact same thing for some of us you saw your mother and your father do. If we're all honest with ourselves. One of the biggest fears that we have, one of the biggest things that we struggle with, and we struggle with this. Listen, late at night when we're all by ourselves and we're trying to balance our books and we know that the reason why we're in the financial situation that we're in today is because we lack self-discipline. We cannot say no to those shoes. But when we're sitting there alone at night and we don't have anybody with us and we realize that the reason why we are isolated from the world is because we don't have the discipline to be able to manage our own tongues and our own attitudes that we push everybody away from us because we get to a place where we say mean and ugly things. When we take our time and really examine our lives, we begin to see exactly what my cousin Saw, and that is, we've got some things on the inside of us. It's not, it don't have anything to do with what's going on on the outside of us. Matter of fact, part of our issue is we try to control too much around us. We try to control too many people. We try to be in control of everybody. But listen to me prophetically, I'm talking to somebody today. The thing that you need is not to control anybody else in your life. You don't need to control another person. You don't need to control your children, your husband. You don't need to control them people down at the job. What you need, listen to me, somebody. You need self-control. Yeah. Yeah. See, you wouldn't have to control those folk down at the job if you were self-controlled. If you just get there on time. I know they're bothering you. But listen, that ain't got nothing to do with the fact that you're getting there late every day. I, I know that they're giving you some grief at work, but that don't have anything to do with the fact that the assignment is late. And sometimes we turn to, to God and to the Bible to, to control some things outside of us when the reality of it is what God really wants, he really wants you to become controlled. He, will, he wants you under control. He wants you disciplined. He wants you to order your steps in his word. He wants you to bridle your tongue in his word. I may not be talking to everybody, but I'm talking to myself. And listen, even if you haven't come to the realization that what I'm saying to you is exactly right, you need to understand that I don't care if you've got bishop in front of your name or, or, or some degree on the back of your name, everybody in this world struggles with the exact same thing I'm talking about today. Everybody in this world, listen, if you are breathing today, you are struggling with the fear uh, of what's going on the inside of you. You know that inside of you is something that has more control over what you feel for God or for anything else. And when it comes to your place of weakness, it always wins. Everybody here knows that you've got something that when it calls your name, no matter what you're doing or what it's going to hurt in the long term, you're going to do it. You don't care at that particular time. Now, you always fall back into remorse. You, you always get to a place where you sit back in regret. And I need to tell somebody today, the enemy wants nothing more for you than for you to be sitting in a place thinking about you messed up again. Yeah. Wow. I, I did it again. I, I, I'm defeated again. I, I, I said it again or I did it again or I was inappropriate again or I cursed again or whatever the case. I, I ran my credit card up again. God gave me the tax money to pay it down. 
<laughs> Preach. Amen. Yeah. I, I was begging, I was praying, I was pleading to God ever since last March, right? Pleading to God, help me, God, help me, God, help me, God. February came around, God gave me a big tax check, I paid everything off, now I'm back on my knees again. Help me, God, March. What I want to do today is I want to exhort you. See, what I don't want to do in this series is to create more fear. But what I want to do is I want to exhort you, and, and I want to start by going back into the New Testament. Now, now, Paul, I want you to understand who Paul is. Paul is responsible for writing the majority of the New Testament. He knows a thing or two about Jesus, right? Matter of fact, everything that we study pretty much that comes out of the New Testament, either Paul is talking about it inside of his writings or it's inside of the New Testament. Paul never deviates from Christ. Amen. Now, 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 listen to this for a second. This same guy that wrote the majority of the New Testament, the same guy that, that, that was bit by a snake for God, the same guy that was stoned for God, the same guy that was in jail for God, this same guy that we all look up to and we thank God. Now, now God created something special when he created Paul. This same guy writes in Romans 7, starting the 14th verse. This is his writing. He, he says, so, so, so the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and it is good. The trouble is with me. And let me just pause for a second. Because what, one of the things that Paul does throughout the course of his ministry is he explains these two natures that are at war inside of us. He's constantly talking about this spirit of God that he received and this flesh that's constantly trying to make him go against the spirit of God. And what Paul comes to as he goes through his study, through his beatings, through, through his snake bites and all these shipwrecks and all these things, he comes to the realization of one thing. The word of God is right. The, the, the word of God from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelations, the word of God is right. It's not an issue with the word, and you know it for yourself. Listen, you understand that the word of God is right. I, I know we get into these conversations about the law and works and all that stuff, but, 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 but let's just drop that for now. Let's, let's just assume that you accepted Christ in your heart and you're going to heaven. Now, let me talk to you about how you're going to get peace in your life today, because the issue with violating this law that we're talking about, this spirit that we're talking about, is the fact that you won't have peace today. Amen. That, that you won't have joy today. I'm talking about right now. I'm talking about when you leave out of here. I'm not talking about the by and by. I'm not talking about when you die and go to heaven and when you see Christ in his glory. We don't need to focus on that so much. I'm talking about the pain that you're feeling right now. I'm talking about the hurt that you're struggling with right now. I'm talking about the fact that self-discipline is robbing you right now of peace. He, he, Paul says, he says, so, so the trouble's not with the law or, or what God is asking us to do. The trouble's not with him asking us not to put that football team above me on Sunday. That's not, that's not the issue. He says, the trouble is with me. He says, for, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. What, what, what Paul begins to communicate to us is just a part of being human is that you're going to have this stuff attached to you and it's called flesh and it is this thing, it's dying, it's not eternal. You've got this eternal spirit inside of you and you've got this flesh thing and they're both at battle with each other and inside of this flesh thing because it's, it's, it's limited, it's, it's filled with sin. And, and, and when you're in this situation where you understand the right thing to do, but you're doing the wrong thing, it's not because the spirit isn't right. It's because you've got this sin on the inside of you. He says, listen to this very closely, because, because somebody's going to be free with this. He says, I don't really understand myself. See, see, you've been trying to figure yourself out, and folk have been trying to figure you out, and, and you've been working and taking uh, classes and, and reading stuff and doing 10 steps and 3 steps and 5 steps, but you need to understand, listen, you can't figure this out. Mm -hmm. you, you can't fix this necessarily on your own. You're going to need the Spirit. He says, for, for, for I want to do what is right. I don't do it. He says, but, but instead, I do the thing I hate. I do the thing that I know is going to bring me the pain. Listen, I do the thing knowing that it's a bad thing. I still do it. But the thing that I should do, the thing that I want to do, the thing that I practice over and over and over in my head, I don't do that thing. 
And not only do I not do that thing, but I end up doing the very thing that I know I should not do. And I end up hurting people and I end up hurting myself. He says, but if I know that what I'm doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So, so, so I'm not the one doing wrong. It is the sin living in me that does it. Paul says, listen, if I understand, if I'm in a situation and I know before I send a text <laughs> that it's wrong, it's not the law. I understand. I was born with the sense to understand uh, before I go to that website. That I got no business going to, the, to this website looking at these things. I, I understand before I make that purchase that, that I don't have the money in the bank to make this purchase. And I understand what I'm doing is wrong and it's taken away from my ability to minister and to serve God. It's not, it's not about the, the word. It's about me. It's about the sin that's inside, inside of my flesh. He says, and... And I know that nothing good lives in me. He says, I know that in me there is no good thing. There's, there's nothing about me that's special. And I know part of what we do and part of what we're taught to do is to really, really toot our own horns. I know, I know we stay in a society where it's all about selling yourself and telling everybody how great you are and putting on your finest clothes. And, and listen, whether you're in a tuxedo or pajamas, you need to understand that you got flesh. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that you struggle. See, part of the problem that we have is that we don't want to admit that we have a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Part of the issue that we have with dealing with this flesh is that we don't want to admit that we're wrong, that, they were, that somebody told us, hey, you, you, you need to fix this thing, and you said, well, I ain't going to fix it, and you want to just live with it and stay with it and stay the course. But we got to get to a place where we say, listen, I know this isn't right. I, I understand the difference between right and wrong. I know that this life that I'm doing doesn't bring honor toward God. Yeah. He says, and, and, and I know that, that nothing good lives in me that, that is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. He, say, he says, I, I, I want to do what is good, but, but I don't. He says, I, I don't want to do what is wrong, but... Do it anyway. He says, but, but if I do what I don't want to do, I, I'm not really the one that's doing the wrong. It is the sin living in me that does it. He says, I, I have discovered this principle. Listen, this principle changes lives in this room. Listen, when you can get this principle into your head, your life is changed because this is the start of help. This is the start of recovery. This is you checking yourself into the facility. When you can get this into your head, your whole life changed. He said, I have discovered this principle of life. That when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I, I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes a, a slave to the sin that is still within me. And, and, and then Paul gets to the place where, where I think we get sometimes in our life where, where you may have even gotten inside of this, this sermon. He says, oh, what a a miserable person I am. Some virgins say, oh, what a wretched person I am. And if we're honest with ourselves, just if we just take some time and be honest with ourselves today, we know exactly what Paul is talking about in these verses. Amen. All of us get to a place in our lives where we realize that the thing that's in our flesh is actually stronger than our willpower. You know, we, we, we talk about willpower, about increasing your willpower. But there are some things that are coming against you from your flesh that are stronger than any willpower that you have. That's why we, we get on these yo-yo diets. Yeah. <laughs> and we get in these yo-yo relationships. Mm -hmm. And we get on these yo-yo jobs. And we get in these yo-yo churches. You know, we, we in and out. But I like what Paul writes here. He says, who will free me 
from this life that is dominated by sin and death. Thank God. Thank God for who? The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And what, what Paul begins to communicate about this principle of life is that, listen, you are going to constantly be in situations where your flesh will have more power over your will, over your mind. But in those instances, we've got a Christ that we can turn to. We've got somewhere we can go. We can pray. We can read the word. We can meditate. We can spend time. Listen, we can press pause. When you're getting ready to do that thing that your flesh is telling you to do, when you get ready to buy that thing that your, that your flesh is telling you to buy, when you're getting ready to go to that place or drink that thing or whatever the case is for you, yeah. you can press pause. Yeah. And you can go to the word of God and you can, you can say, what would Jesus do in this situation? What strength can I find from the scripture? You can meditate and you can spend time with God. And I'm not talking about that. That Eastern meditation, which, which I struggle to understand, they basically tell you to get everything out your head. You got to be, can't be thinking about nothing, right? You got to focus on the sound and just, and just meditate. I, pastor's not talking about that. D David said, I meditated on his word day and night. You, you write the scripture on your heart so that when you're in situations and you can't get to your Bible, you can recall what the Bible said, what thus said the Lord about the situations in your life. You've got to get to the place where you get everything out your mind except for Christ. You press pause and you, you sit down right where you are before you make that purchase. You press pause and you wait 24 hours and in that 24 hours you fast and you seek God. But before you send that inappropriate text or before you walk off that job or before you go off, you press pause and you ask the Holy Spirit to come inside of your life. You literally give control over to God. Yes. yes. Google's bad for a lot of things, but Google is good for searching situations. And when you get into a situation in your life and you need a verse and you haven't quite gotten those verses, you Google God and say, Google, Google and say, God, send me something on <laughs> On, on, on how to deal with difficult people and then Google will give you some verses and then you get inside of your Bible and you pray and meditate. You read the word, then you sit there and think about it. And then you pray to God and you say, God, show me how this word applies to my spirit. Show me how I can be strengthened and be more disciplined in my spirit. Speak to my heart, convict me. Show me how this scripture applies to me. What Paul tells Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, is that God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. We don't have to fear our bodies. We don't have to fear our flesh. We don't have to fear our attitudes. We don't have to fear our tongues. We don't have to fear what we're going to do in any situation. We don't have to fear our addictions. We don't have to fear our family history and our generational issues. We don't have to fear any of that stuff because God has given us dunamis power. He's given us agape love, and he's given us this new thing that he introduces today, which is self-discipline. Uh -huh. now, now, this word for death, for self-discipline is sophronimos, a very powerful word. Now, we generally interpret this word as sound judgment or sound mind because we don't like using the word discipline. I figured it out. Uh -huh. We have always said that God has not given us spirit of fear, but he's given us power, love, and sound mind. Because we don't like to use the word discipline. But when you look this word up in the Greek, it means discipline. God has not only given you the sound mind to understand. You know what Paul said? I've got this spirit working on the inside of me and it's giving me everything. The spirit is the law. The spirit is giving me everything. It's telling me what's right and what's wrong. But that don't mean anything if you don't do anything with it. And, and so what Paul is saying is that you've got this spirit inside of you that gives you the ability to discipline yourself. Yeah. He, he says not only do you have the sound judgment, but you also have the self-control. Listen, I want to tell somebody today. You don't have to do what you've been doing. I know you've been told since you were young that this, this is just who you are. But, but, but the Bible tells us, what Paul tells us is that you don't have to be in fear of any issues that you have going on in your flesh. Surely you've made some mistakes, but start today by forgiving yourself for the mistakes that you've made. Start today by forgiving the folk who've hurt you. Start today by, by forgiving yourself and others. Start today by, by asking God for forgiveness, by, by coming to him and being honest with him today about your issues, about the things that you struggle with. Start today by being transparent with yourself yes. and with your God. 
Understand the day that God, he hasn't given you a spirit of fear. You don't have to worry about your addiction. You don't have to worry about your issue. You don't have to worry about your tongue. You don't have to worry about your lustful nature. You don't have to worry about any of those things because you have dunamis power, agape love, and sophronimus. Self-discipline all on the inside of you. It's just, it's just waiting to be tapped into. You've got everything you need because 90% of it is just knowing the word. You know, they say 90% of it is, is just the fact that you know what to do. All you got to do is do it. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about this, this self-discipline thing. I, I went back through scripture a little bit. And, and the first thing that I saw was self-discipline is an indicator of spirituality. You know, we want to think that we're close to God. We want to think that we're doing the right thing. But the way that you really get to understand whether or not you are a part of the kingdom, whether or not you are close to God, whether or not you're spiritually in the right place is through these things called fruit of the spirit. Let me just give you an understanding of what he's talking about here. In Galatians 5, Paul is explaining these two different kind of fruits. He, he, he continues to talk about this through his ministry. He continues to talk about the fact that you've got this flesh and that's fruit of the flesh. And listen, when you get some time this week, go and read the list. I don't even want to put it up here. It's all kind of evil and bad things that represent who we are, if we're honest. That represent what we struggle with, if we're honest. And he says that when you're living in the flesh, you produce these fruits. These fruits constantly come out of your life. When you live in the flesh, these things come out of your mouth. When you live in the flesh, these actions happen out of the members of your body because your, your body is just moving on what, what you're telling it to do. And, and then he comes back and he says, but if you are in the spirit, these fruit ought to be manifesting themselves in your life. In other words, what he's saying is you got two different trees, right? You got an apple tree and an orange tree. He said, now, if you really an apple, you're going to have apples on your tree, not oranges. And he said, if you really an orange, you're going to have oranges on your tree and not apples. And, and it don't work where you can just go out. And this is what we do a lot of times. We go to an apple tree because we want to be an orange. And we take oranges and we tie them and put them on the tree. And, and, and what the Spirit of the Lord says is, you can't mask this. Eventually, although you may look good on the outside, although the, from a distance, people may see that, that fake fruit that you put up on that tree. When they get close to you, when they get beyond your, 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 the walls that you've set up, and they really get a chance to see who you are, they understand you're not an orange tree. You're an apple tree. You, you're not living for God. You're not uh, 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 the fruit of the spirit, but you are still fruit of the, of the flesh. Look what he says here. He says, but, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. You ought to be seeing these things in, in your life if you're connected to the spirit. Goodness, faith, gentleness. And, and the last one, he, he, he says at the base Self-control. Now, I want you to think about this for a second. Because when we look at 1 Timothy, he says, I've given you love, power, and the last one is what? Self-control. And, and, and so what Paul is communicating, or at least what the revelation for me and what Paul is communicating is self-control is the foundation by which you build any of the, these principles of God on. Listen, if you've got love, but you don't have self-control, you're going you're gonna to end up in some inappropriate situations in your life. You, listen, you've got to be able to love people and not go too far into that love. You've got to have self-control and that love. Listen, if, if, if you have power and you don't have self-control, you, you're just abusive. You just mean to people. You mean spirited. And, and so self-control is the glue that makes all of the all these fruits of the spirit come together and work because without self-control, any of these fruits only become a way that we, we manipulate people. And, and you've seen people who have these fruits and they use them for manipulation, right? Because they don't have self-control. Let's go a little bit further. We, not only does the Bible say that self-control it's an it's a indicator of where we are spiritually, but, but you need to understand this. Self-control is going to determine your legacy. When, when folk come to your final viewing, when those folks stand up and talk about you, 
They're going to be talking about whether or not you lived a life of self-control. I've been to too many funerals now to know. I've been to the ones when people didn't have self-control. I've heard the, the painful testimonies and the jokes that people try to, to tell to hide the fact that this person lived a life with no self-control. Look what, look what Paul says. He says, instead, I, I discipline my, my body. And I bring it under strict control, under self-control. I'm disciplining my body. I'm doing the right thing. I'm reading the word. I'm holding myself accountable. I'm doing what's right, even when I don't want to do it. He says, so that, that after preaching to others, after I walk around and talk about what kind of Christian I am, after I walk around and talk about my degrees, after I walk around and talk about how good I am and how wonderful I am, after all that stuff that I do to make myself look good, that I myself will not be disqualified. And listen to me for a second, because we don't need no more of this. We, we've had this around us for the past hundred of years. What people who we put our trust into, ministers that we put our trust into, family members that we put our trust into, some of us, our fathers, our mothers, our kinfolk, our husbands, our wives, we put our trust into them because they said a certain thing and they looked a certain way and we thought that they had it all together and we found out that they were living a life that was disqualifying. And I want to exhort you today, I want to exhort you to take an inventory of the way you treat people. Take an inventory of, the, of how faithful you are to God. Take an inventory of how much you pray and how much you fast and how much you, you go to God. And, and take an inventory of how you are as a husband and how you are as a wife and how you are as a single person. How you are as a child. Take an inventory. And understand that the things that we are doing today are determining what people are going to think about us. Listen, at some point, each and every one of us are going to be defined by our self-discipline. <laughs> think, think, think about it like this right here. The reason why you, 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 you like those athletes, the reason why we like those singers, the reason why we, we go to those places, we spend money to go to those places, is because we really admire their discipline. It takes a lot of discipline to make it to the NFL, to make it to the NBA. It takes a lot of sacrifice and discipline to get up on stage and get a recording deal. It takes a lot of sacrifice and discipline. And we really like, listen, we like them so much. That we'll buy their stuff. If they just put their name on it, we'll buy it. We'll, we'll buy the Jordans. We, want, we know we can't jump like Jordan, but because he had that discipline and that greatness in his life, we feel like if we put on those shoes, we're going to inherit a little bit of that discipline and that greatness, right? We'll, we'll get a jersey with another man's name on our back. Men, we'll get a jersey with another man's name on our back because he has self-discipline enough to make it to a pinnacle that, that we know we couldn't make it to. Your, your, your legacy is at stake. This is what Paul teaches us about, about self-control. He says, no, no discipline, no discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. It's painful. And, and, and you got to understand this today. Even as we begin to talk about self-control, even as I begin to exhort you towards self-control, when you leave here, you're going to understand fully what he's saying. It's going to be painful to put down that that snack, whatever it is that you got to put down, it's going to be painful for you to separate yourself from whatever life you're in right now. It's going to be painful for you to get somewhere on time. It's going to be painful for you to do the things that you need to do in order to bring the discipline in your life. It's going to be painful when you have to say no to buying that thing or to signing up for that thing. But what you need to understand, but after you do this, after you bring this self-control into your life, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living, of righteousness. You get peace and, and righteousness from this. He says, for, for those who are trained in this way, they get this peace and this righteousness. Think about this now. How much more peaceful would, would your life be if you just had a little bit more self-control? Think, think about the things that you struggle with. Think about the issues of your life. Think about the things that impact your legacy. Think about the things that are stopping you. I know that you think they just don't like you at work. But, but think about some of the things that may be stopping you from getting that next promotion, that, the discipline that it takes to get that next promotion, to be at that next level. He, he says, so, 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 so take a, a new grip. 
with, with your tired hands and, and strengthen your weak knees. Mark out a straight path for you, for your feet, so that those who are weak and lame will not fall but become strong. Listen, although the spirit is going to be the thing that helps you get through this self-discipline, there is some requirement for you. You've got to get yourself to the position where you're strong, where you become as strong as you possibly can in your flesh, in your will. Right. You've got to do these things that help put you in a position where the spirit can work inside of you. Because, listen, I, at least I have not come across a story in the Bible where a person who was just in their sin who was just doing what they want to do, receive some power from God. It just I, you, may, Maybe after service, we can get together, you can show me. But, but generally, at some point in every Bible story, a person says, I'm going the wrong way. I need you, God. And then dunamis power comes in. And then agape love comes in. And then this sophronimus self-discipline. God, God even changes that name. He goes from Abram to Abraham. He, he even changes that name. He goes from Saul to Paul. He even changes their name. Once they get to the point that they say, I messed up and I need some discipline in my life, begin to work your spirit inside of me. Me? God even changes their name. There are a few things that, that, that you got to that you got to do in order to get to this place where we become strong. The first thing that you need to do, you've got to get to a place where you fear God. That is our number one problem. We don't fear God. We, we fear loneliness. And because we fear loneliness, we allow our flesh, married folk and single folk, to pull you into somebody's bed that's going to ultimately cause you a lot of pain, a lot of hurt, a, a lot of heartache, and a lot of shame. That's what happens. That's the reality. Because we fear loneliness greater than we fear God. Because in that same situation, if we reverence God, if we love God, then we would choose not to do it. Yeah. We, we, we fear being taken advantage of or being talked down to. And so instead of us fearing God in that situation and leaning toward our kindness and leaning toward saying the right thing or doing the right thing, we, we fear more people taking advantage of us. And so we are quick to put people in their place. We've got to get to a place where we figure out, look what he says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and discipline. We've got to get to the place where we fear God so that he can pour inside of us his spirit, his knowledge, his wisdom, his discipline. Second thing we've got to do is we've got to get to a place that we seek godly vision. We've got to get to a place where we seek godly vision. Look what he says in Proverbs 29. Solomon, the smartest man who ever lived, says... Where there is no vision, this word for vision is the same word for revelation. Where there is no vision from God, where we don't know clearly why we were created, where we don't understand our purpose. Where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. They don't have discipline. If you don't know why God called you or who he called you to be or what God wants to do with you in this life, then you are going to be all over the place doing everything. Anytime somebody comes to you, you're going to sign up for it and you're going to do anything. And you've been around people who don't have vision. And because they don't have vision, they have no self-discipline. He says, he says but, but happy is he who keeps the law. Happy is he who has self-discipline. We got to also set godly priorities. You got to get to the place where you put what God wants you to do above what you want to do and above what all the people in your life want you to do. See, part of our issue is that we are letting too many people outside of us and God control what we do. Look what he says right here. He says in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, everything is permissible. You can do anything you want to do. If you've accepted Christ into your life, Paul says, if you, if you know him in your heart, you've accepted Christ in your life, everything is permissible. You can do what you want to do. You can eat what you want to eat. He says, but, but not everything is helpful. He, he, say, he says everything is permissible, but not everything builds up. And what we've got to be able to do is we've got to start praying for discernment and understanding the things that we're doing. Are they helpful? Are they building us up? And, and anything that, that, that we say no to that, this is not helpful. This is not building me up. Matter of fact, this is hurting me. This is tearing me down. We've got to quickly begin to get those things as far away from us as possible. And the way that we do that is by, is by building godly walls. 
look, look, what it, look, what, look what Solomon says in Proverbs 25 and 28. He says, like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. I want you to get a vision of this. Paul's talking about a time in our society where they literally had to build walls to keep people out. It was very barbaric. And what they would do is they would build these huge walls around a city. And that's how you became free. I know it seems like when you build walls around you that you lose freedom. But the reality of it is during this time, the only way you could be free, the only way you could be wrong, I've been to wrong. That's a wall that still exists today. The only way that you could be free from everybody else who wants to attack you is that you have this wall. Now, inside of this wall, you're free to do anything that you want to do. But but outside of this wall, if you go outside of this wall, you're in danger. And, and, and what, 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 what Solomon is communicating is we need to get to a place where we've got walls around us because part of the issue is that we've let walls down in areas where they shouldn't be down. We've allowed for the enemy to come in and attack us right where we live, right? We've allowed for our protection, the Holy Spirit that's supposed to surround us and build a hedge of protection around us, but we've not fully accepted that hedge. And because we haven't done that, the enemy is attacking you. And he's attacking you, for some of us, on every side. And we've got to get to a place in our lives where we build walls. Not walls against people. I know, I know we do that sometimes. We, we build walls against God. We build walls against the people who love us because we are constantly being attacked by the enemy so we don't trust anybody. That, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about building walls of self-discipline. Stop trying to control everybody else and start examining yourself. What walls do you need to build? Do you, do you need to be going to lunch with the opposite sex right now? Do you, do, do, are you strong enough in your flesh? Do you need to be texting? You know, you know, for some of us, everybody who gets a call from the opposite sex is married. I, I strongly suggest that those calls come to your home phone where everybody can answer it. We got to build some walls around ourselves that that help us be protected from from the enemy. And, and, and this is what I want to tell you, because 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 some of us, we, we're weak. We've got some areas where we're weak. And, and, and I want to read this to you. I, I want you to understand this. The, the, the Holy Spirit is going to protect you where you're weak. You, you don't have to be overcome with fear, with the issues of your life, the issues of your flesh, because the Holy Spirit is working inside of you. If you would just strengthen yourself, or you would just, if you just become a little bit strong in those areas, if you just apply your own self-discipline, the Holy Spirit will come in and he'll pick you up. And I know, listen, there are going to be some times when you're going to want to go to that site or you're going to want to do that thing or you're going to want to go to that place or you're going to want to eat that thing or drink that thing. And, and it's going to require for you to pause and then take Tap into the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit, as Paul says here, in Romans 8, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. Yes. For, for example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. What I want to exhort you today to do. Is I want you to get to a place in your life where you have enough self-control to put God in control. I, I want you to get to a place in your life where you identify the issues, the struggles, the things in your flesh that uniquely affect you because all of us got some different. We got some overlap, but all of us got some different going on inside of our flesh that is not a good thing. And the only thing that's going to help you, the only thing that's going to save your legacy, the only thing that's going to take you to the next level is the self-discipline that comes through the Holy Spirit. So, so, so this week, I, I want you focused on this. My self-control comes from putting the Holy Spirit in control. As you go through this week, I want you to take some time and really identify those things, those areas where you need self-control. And I want you to take some time this week and go to God. Search his word for your issues. Everything's in the Bible. Listen, everything's in the Bible. And spend some time in meditation thinking about the word, asking God to speak to your heart. Listen, God's going to change your life. God, God's going to fix these issues inside of you. Your legacy is going to be great because of the changes that you're going to make today to, to make self-discipline a very important part of your life. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen.
Fenomena To the living God No one can deny That Jesus Christ Jesus Christ 